Happy Sunday. I'm doing short stories. The first one was from the Buddha. The second one was Think by David Foster Wallace. Or actually, were there three? I think this is three. This is by Vladimir Nabokov. I haven't bought the new um, compilation of his short stories in paperback. I ordered it on Amazon, so I just printed it out. I'm reading my favorite short stories. This one's called Symbols and Signs. For the fourth time in as many years, they were confronted with the problem of what birthday presents to take to a young man who was incurably deranged in his mind. Desires he had none. Man-made objects were either to him hives of evil vibrant with a malignant activity that he alone could perceive, or gross comforts for which no use could be found in his abstract world. After eliminating a number of articles that might offend or frighten him, anything in the gadget line, for instance, was taboo, his parents chose a dainty and innocent trifle, a basket with ten different fruit jellies in ten little jars. At the time of his birth, they had already been married for a long time. A score of years had elapsed, and now they were quite old. Her drab gray hair was pinned up carelessly. She wore cheap black dresses. Unlike other women of her age, such as Miss Soul, their next-door neighbor, whose face was all pink and mauve with paint and whose hat was a cluster of brookside flowers, she presented a naked white countenance to the fault-finding light of spring. Her husband, who, was in, who in the old country had been a fairly successful businessman, and now in New York, wholly dependent on his brother Isaac, a real American of almost 40 years standing. They seldom saw Isaac and had nicknamed him the Prince. That Friday, their son's birthday, everything went wrong. The subway train lost its life current between the two stations, and for a quarter of an hour they could hear nothing but the dutiful beating of their hearts and the rustling of newspapers. The bus they had to take was late and kept them waiting a long time on a street corner, and when it did come it was crammed with the garrulous high school children. It began to rain as they walked up the brown path leading to the sanitarium. There they waited again. And instead of their boy shuffling into the room, as he usually did, his porcelain face confused, ill-shaven, and blotched with acne, a nurse they knew, and did not care for, appeared at last, and brightly explained that he had again attempted to take his life. He was all right, she said, but a visit from his parents might disturb him. The place was so miserably understaffed, and things got mislaid or mixed up so easily that they decided not to leave their present in the office, but to bring it to him the next time they came. Outside the building, she waited for her husband to open his umbrella, then took his arm. He kept clearing his throat, as he always did when he was upset. <clears throat> they reached the bus, shop stealth, the, the bus stop shelter on the other side of the street, and he closed his umbrella. A few feet away, under a swaying and dripping tree, a tiny, unfledged bird was helplessly twitching in a puddle. During the long ride to the subway station, she and her husband did not exchange a word, and every time she glanced at his old hands clasped and twitching upon the handle of the umbrella and saw their swollen veins and brown-spotted skin, she felt the mounting pressure of tears. As she looked around, trying to hook her mind onto something, it gave her a kind of soft shock, a mixture of compassion and wonder, to notice that one of the passengers, a girl with dark hair and grubby red toenails, was weeping on the shoulder of an older woman. Whom did that woman resemble? She resembled Rebecca Borisovna, whose daughter had married one of the Solvyacheks Solve Solve in Minsk Hello. Oh, years ago. The last time the boy had tried to do this, his method had been, in the doctor's word, a masterpiece of inventiveness. 
He would have succeeded had not an envious fellow patient thought he was learning to fly and stopped him just in time. What he had really wanted to do was tear a hole in his world and escape. The system of his delusions had been the subject of an elaborate paper in a scientific monthly, which the doctor at the sanitarium had given him to read. Long before that, she and her husband had puzzled it out for themselves. Referential mania, the article called it. In these very rare cases, the patient imagines that everything happening around him is a veiled reference to his personality and existence. He excludes real people from the conspiracy because he considers himself to be so much more intelligent than other men. Phenomenal nature shadows him wherever he goes. Cloud and the staring sky transmit to each other by means of slow signs incredibly detailed information regarding him. His inmost thoughts are discussed at nightfall in a manual alphabet by darkly gesticulating trees. Darkly gesticulating trees. Pebbles or stains or sunflecks form patterns representing in some awful way messages that he must intercept. Everything is a cipher, and of everything he is the theme. All around him there are spies. Some of them are detached observers like glass surfaces and still pools. Others, such as coats in store windows, are prejudiced witnesses, lynchers at hearts. Others again, running storms, running water storms, are hysterical to the point of insanity and have distorted opinion of him and grotesquely misinterpret his actions. He must be always on guard and devote every minute and module of life to decoding the undulation of things. The very air he exhales is indexed and filed away. If only the interest he provokes were limited to his immediate surroundings, but alas, it is not. With distance, the torrents of wild scandal increase in volume and volubility. The silhouettes of his blood corpuscles, magnified a million times, flit over vast plains and still farther away great mountains of unbearable solidity at height sum up. In terms of granite and groaning firs, the ultimate truth of his being. When they emerged from the thunder and foul air of the subway, the last dregs of the day were mixed with the streetlights. She wanted to buy some fish for supper, so she handed him a basket of jelly jars, telling him to go home. Accordingly, he returned to their tenement house, walked up the third landing, and then remembered he had given his keys earlier in the day. Video from the New Yorker, the mother's most vulnerable to uh, incarceration. Video from the New Yorker, the mother's most vulnerable to incarceration. In silence, he sat down on the steps, and in silence rose when some ten minutes later, she came trudging heavily up the stairs, smiling wanly, wanely, smiling wanly, and shaking her head in deprecation of her silliness. They entered their two-room flat, and he at once went to the mirror straining the corners of his mouth apart by means of his thumbs with a horrible mask-like grimace he removed his new hopelessly comfortable hopelessly uncomfortable dental plate he read his russian language newspaper while she laid the table still reading he ate the pale victuals that needed no teeth she knew his moods and was also silent when he had gone to bed she remained in the living room with her pack of soiled playing cards and her old photograph albums across the narrow courtyard where the rain tinkled in the dark against some ash cans windows were blandly alight and in them of a black in one of them a black trousered man with his hands clasped under his head and his elbows raised could he seen lying supine on an untidy bed she pulled the blind down and examined the photographs as a baby he looked more surprised than most babies a photograph of a german maid they had in leipzig and her fat-faced fiance fell out of the fold of the album she turned the pages of the book minsk the revolution leipzig berlin leipzig again a slanting house front badly out of focus here was the boy when he was four years old in a park, shyly with puckered forehead, looking away from an eagle, eager squirrel, as he would have from any other stranger. 
Here was Aunt Rosa, a fussy, angular, wild-eyed old lady who had lived in a tremulous world of bad news, bankruptcies, train accidents, and cancerous growths until the Germans put her to death, together with all the people she had worried about. The boy, aged six, that was when, together with all the people, she, oh, that was when he drew, the boy, aged six, that was when he drew, Wonderful birds with human hands and feet, and suffered from insomnia like a grown-up man. His cousin, now a famous chess player. The boy, again, aged about eight, already hard to understand. Afraid of wallpaper in the passage. Afraid of certain pictures in the book, which merely showed idyllic landscape with the rocks. With rocks on a hillside and an old cart hanging from one branch of a leafless tree. Here he was at ten, the year they left for Europe. She remembered the shame, the pity, the humiliating difficulties of the journey, and the ugly, vicious, backward children he had. He was with in the special school where they had placed, where he had been placed after they had arrived in America. And then came the time in his life, coinciding with long convalescence after pneumonia when those little phobias of his which his parents had stubbornly regarded as the eccentricities of a prodigiously gifted child hardened, as it were, into a dense tangle of logically interacting illusions, making them totally inaccessible to normal minds. All this, and much more, she had accepted, for after all, living does not, uh, living does mean accepting the loss of one joy after another, not even joys in her case, mere possibilities of improvement. She thought of the recurrent waves of pain that for some reason or other, she and her husband had had to endure, of the invisible gains hurting her boy in some unimaginable fashion, of the incalculable amount of tenderness contained in the world, of the fate of this tenderness, which is either crushed or wasted or transformed into madness. Of neglected children humming to themselves in unswept corners of beautiful weeds that cannot hide from the farmer. It was nearly midnight when, from the living room, she heard her husband moan, and presently he staggered in, wearing over his nightgown the old overcoat with the astrakhan collar he much preferred to his nice blue bathrobe. I can't sleep, he cried. Why can't you sleep? she asked. You are tired. I can't sleep because I'm dying, he said, and lay on the couch. Is it your stomach? Do you want me to call Dr. Solov? No doctors, no doctors, he moaned to the devil with the doctors. We must get him out of here quick. Otherwise, we'll be responsible, responsible. He hurled himself into a sitting position, both feet on the floor, thumping his forehead with clenched fist. All right, she said quietly. We will bring him home tomorrow morning. I will like some tea, said her husband, and went out to the bathroom. Bending with difficulty, she retrieved some playing cards and a photograph or two that had slipped to the floor. The knave of hearts, the nine of spades, the ace of spades, the maid Elsa and her bestial bow. He returned in high spirits, saying in a loud voice, I have it all figured out. We will give him the bathroom. We will give him the bedroom. Not the bathroom, they give him the bedroom. T. Each of us will spend part of the night near him as the other part of this couch. We will have the doctor see him at least twice a week. It does not matter what the prince says. He, do, he won't have much to say anyway because it will come out cheaper. The telephone rang. It was an unusual hour for it to ring. He stood in the middle of the room, groping with his foot for one slipper that had come off, and childless, childishly, toothlessly, gasped at his wife. Since she knew more than more English than he, she always attended to the calls. Can I speak to Charlie? A girl's dull little voice said to her now. What number do you want? No, you have the wrong number. She put the receiver down gently, and her hand went to her heart. It frightened me, she said. He smiled a quick smile and immediately resumed his exciting monologue. They would fetch him as soon as it was day. 
for his own protection, they would keep all the knives locked in the drawer. Even at his worst, he presented no danger to other people. The telephone rang a second time. The same toneless, anxious young voice asked for Charlie. You have the incorrect number. I will tell you what you are doing. You are turning the letter O instead of the zero. She hung up again. They sat down to their unexpected festive midnight tea. He sipped noisily. His face was flushed. Every now and then he raised the glass in a circular motion so as to make the sugar dissolve more thoroughly. The vein on the side of his bald head stood out conspicuously, and silvery brushes showed his chin. The birthday present stood on the table. While she poured him another glass of tea, he put on spectacles and re-examined with pleasure the luminous yellow, green, and red little jars. His clumsy, moist lips spelled out their eloquent labels. Apricot, grape, peach plum, quince. He had got to crab apple when the telephone rang again. 